What the Tech is sponsored by. Hover.com, domain names made simple. Go to gfq.hover.com and get 10% off your entire purchase. And by Stitcher Radio. Listen on the go via the Stitcher mobile app. For more information, go to stitcher.com slash gfq. Welcome, everybody, to the Paul Therott Variety Hour. I'm your host, Andrew Zarian, and with me, as always, Paul the Iceman Therott. Speaking of the Iceman, how about those Knicks? Oh, don't, don't. <laughs> I know. I know. They're, they're just awful. They're just awful, and you have to rub it in every week. My bulls are, are, are nearly dead. Uh, nice, every- nice. The Bulls did. Uh, it's just a, such a shame. I'm a Bulls fan, and they did awful. And the Knicks are just, just awful in every possible way. But your Celtics, they're not bad. Not bad, but not great. Yeah. So I think first round is not going to be a problem. But that will be the end of that. Listen, at least we have the Rangers here in New York. But yeah. nobody, nobody's watching hockey, so that doesn't even matter. It's like they're playing for four people. Sure. Uh, this is what the tech. This is a tech show, not a sports show. Uh, you may be surprised by that, but uh, <laughs> every week it's it's sports and history. Now, every week we just end up going either into World War II or how awful the Knicks are. You know, I have season tickets to the Celtics that I split with other people, and if you'd like to see what it's like to watch basketball in May, <laughs> I could uh, <laughs> I could make that Wait a minute. happen. There's basketball in May. I thought that stopped in the nineties. <laughs> I thought it's the gonna, 90s it won't were the be happening in June, though. I, I know. <laughs> so. I know that you know it's just awful. But yeah. this is what the tech we discuss uh, tech, not necessarily tech news, but things that uh, we want to talk about. Uh, I know Paul is very much inter- interested in patent news, so today we're going to dedicate the entire show to patent news <laughs> yes. and uh, internet security. Uh, no, we're wow. going. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long one, guys going to be a long one no Absolutely. listen i i i know a lot of people like that but i don't necessarily find that stuff interesting there are times that it's interesting but uh, not for the long run uh, it must be like what it's like to uh, have two accountants that marry each other and then that, that's all they talk that's about all they dinner. talk about yeah yeah patents and and uh stuff like that stuff like that uh, last week we we ended the show i don't know if if you guys were watching last week which i hope you were uh, we, we do the 10-year game at the end of each show where uh, you guys, the audience, sends us an email and you uh, send us two topics or company names or whatever it is, two items of, technolo- of, of tech. Mm-hmm. And, you wanna, and we play the game where Paul and I predict where this thing will be in 10 years. Uh, we did uh, Android. We've done the iPhone. We've done television. And overwhelmingly... I guess due to last week's discussion, we got Google. Yeah. And rather than playing the 10-year game with Google at the end of the show, because we could dedicate an entire show to this, we are going to discuss where Google could possibly be in 10 years. I mean, we're going to play the 10-year game at the end of the, the show, but mm-hmm. uh, we, I want to discuss Google. I want to discuss uh, a few other things, uh, like uh, I'm planning on getting an Ultra Book. Uh, the yep. X, the ninety nine dollar Xbox. It actually looks like the two ninety nine dollar Xbox in my show notes. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I that I would, do what you meant. You you understood. I'm up on current events. <laughs> so ah. I, I I saw that and I I understood. So I I let I want to dive in th- right into this Google's thing because I mean Paul it was crazy I maybe got like. We don't get too many emails. I mean, maybe we get like 10 emails a week, you know, mm-hmm. depending. Sometimes they're just calling me an idiot, yep. uh, which I did get called an idiot this week for for totally the wrong reason. If I was an idiot, I would take responsibility. But this person misunderstood my entire point. Okay. And then they apologized when I further explained yep. it and sent them the clip. They go, oh, I thought you were saying this when I wasn't. Yep. No, that happens. all. I time. actually sent you an email saying, I can't believe how stupid people are. I saw that. Uh, and yeah, it was real, yeah. no real follow up to it. Nothing. That was it. End of sentence. 
<laughs> so uh, overwhelmingly, you guys sent me messages and you yeah. want us to discuss Google. And I know the chat room likes to uh, get in on this too. So we're gonna go. We're gonna go directly into this. Uh, where will Google be in ten years? You said something very interesting last week. You said that's uh, unlikely, but continue. You say something interesting all the time. <laughs> this is okay. the Paul Thoreau Variety Hour. You said that they are possibly approaching mm. some antitrust issues. Not possibly. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, you are. said well, they are, but you you predicted that they are probably going to have to go to court. Yeah. And it's going to be dragged out very similar to what happened to Microsoft in the 90s. Because of their dominance in nearly every single market and their their yeah. stealing of technology, their yeah. uh, crushing of the competition. Uh, they could potentially be forced to split off their divisions. I don't. Well, you know what is? <laughs> well, what is their division? Yeah, right? because they I only mean, have one source of revenue. It occurred to me today. I I've had I, I had to write and then revise a story about Google's court troubles this week. You know, with the Oracle trial, and it looks like they're going to get off as scot free as you can get off after having been found guilty of the the thing in hand. You know. Um, it, it occurred to me that Google is an online advertising company. That's what they are. I mean, that's their core. I mean, there's no... no but that's... Because that's where they make 99% of their revenues, that where, literally is what they are. So they what, do all this other stuff. But, Paul, other than... I, you know, I guess they do have some sort of revenue stream. I mean, they have some of these extra things that they do and now with Google Drive and... Yeah, but uh, none of that music. stuff is no. amounts to anything. Yeah, so, so it's all, all ad revenue. Yeah. In other words, this is a company, this is a classic example of an antitrust issue where a company can use and, and abuse their market power in one area to enter other markets at will, right? And um, Google has absolutely done this, right? There's no doubt about it. Um, it's, it's very interesting. And, and I actually think that their antitrust issues are going to be primarily in the European Union. I think that's going to be the big stumbling block that they have. Uh, this, this is a really interesting difference in the way that the United States and, and Europe approaches antitrust. Where they, they seem uh, to be a lot uh, stricter. Well, and they're, they're focused on harm to businesses, whereas antitrust in the United States is focused largely on harm to consumers. You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting and, and kind of subtle difference, but it, it's an important difference. And I think... Um, I, I do think that Google's going to have antitrust issues around the world, but I think the ones that are, are going to stick are going to be in Europe. You know, now it, it's 15 years later, right? So Google could respond to this stuff a lot differently than Microsoft did, and I think there's some. Uh, not, well, well, there's no evidence of well, that. Well, also, I, I think, think there's some precedent for doing that, right? And I because think Google Intel, probably Google's probably learned from Microsoft's mistakes. Well, you would hope so. I mean, they seem to be treading in the same areas that Microsoft did, right, abusing uh, other companies and so forth. But, um, you know, Intel had antitrust issues in Europe, and they settled. You know, and they, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Well, you know, there well, was no big trial. Would, there was but, no big, you know, court case. There was no, you know, they weren't pulling um, executives out to give depositions, and, you know, like we saw in the Microsoft trial. Well, he, here's the the other side to this and, and this is pretty much what will if, if this if this does happen which i think it will um what saves google is the fact that they don't create any revenue from most of these products that they have <laughs> yeah. so they're good they're going to turn around and be like but well, we don't make money from this uh it, we're but, doing a good we're just putting it out there but the advertising doesn't make money in itself you know so adver yeah. the advertising where they do make money has to have a platform of some kind to reach users and the way that that happens today by and large is through their search product you know one of the problems with and you could say well you know we don't make money on android why are you going to sue us for that well if android was created created with stolen technology it's actually it's still it's always illegal to steal technology yeah. and then giving it away for free is kind of another level of theft when you think about it um so we'll see. I, I, I think that the next 10 years for Google will involve a rapid maturation of the company, something that Microsoft did. Well, actually, they did it very rapidly, too. I mean, they kind of coasted for 20, 25 years and then ran into this brick wall. I think Google yeah. can look back and see what happened with Microsoft especially, but also with these other companies, and uh, hopefully learn their lesson and 
voluntarily change the way they do. I mean, things. Google's pretty, pr- uh, pretty much a new company. If you look at the grand scheme of things, uh, yeah. as far as the internet goes, they're not really new. But if you look at you know where Microsoft is and Apple and IBM, I mean, a hundred plus years, uh, they're they're a new company. So when when you compare the two, I think Microsoft is a lot more mature. Uh, and they've learned. I mean, in the 90s, there wasn't as much competition. Now there is some competition. Sure. And they're kind of still falling in the same tracks that Microsoft did as far as the antitrust stuff because of their shared dominance of the market. But does that necessarily mean they'll be forced to split? I don't think they'll be forced to split. <coughs> no, I don't think it will ever come to that. I, it won't come to that. But where do, will they come up with a different source of revenue? Because the ad revenue... I was reading something and they're saying online ad, you know, revenue was up every year, but their way of targeting advertising is not growing at the pace that it once was. Yeah. And, and I think they see a lot of the future of that is going to be the mobile space. Th- there may come a time, by the way, where Google matures to the point where some of this stuff that's in Google could be spun off. You know, uh, you could make a really good case for Android eventually being spun off and being its own company again. You know, that once it's established itself and has matured to a certain point and, uh, you know, that it could become a either a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Google or literally a separate company. And, uh, you know, we can't it's hard to kind of foresee how they'll do that. But, you know, Google uh, has already taken some steps since Larry Page became CEO to simplify its product lineup, which I think is a great idea. They have had and still have in many ways way too much stuff. I mean, they're just kind of all over the map. Well, they're all yeah, over the map, and they don't complete their projects. Yeah. If, if you look at it, I mean, they bought Grand Central. Uh, they bought, uh, I think it was Gizmo 5, which was their chat client. And, and it took them it, – it's been so half-assed with the implementation of the all features of has, yeah. and everything. Oh, they, they, there's probably hundreds of companies they bought. Didn't they buy um, – it was Google. They bought Picnic, right? Yes, I believe yeah, I so. I think the yeah. Yeah, photo editing service. I mean, yeah. and now that's gone, right? Some of these things they – they buy them and then nothing comes of them. You know, obviously when they had bought Android early on, uh, that which I think was called Android, if I'm not mistaken, the company, the, um, you know, there had been some speculation that Google was going to get into the mobile phone game, and then. I mean, they. they I, I'll probably say they're the most successful half-ass company of all time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look well, at their total uh, lineup. You can afford to be crazy when you have money coming in hand over fist. I mean, they figured yeah. out some golden ticket way of making money online. I mean, so. Uh, this has funded a lot of stuff. I mean, it's what Microsoft did too, although with some exceptions, and absolutely there were exceptions. I mean, there, there, there was a time when Microsoft wanted to go off and become a content company, for, for example. But they, they've kind of stuck to a an area of the market that makes sense for them, you know, um, uh, that makes sense given what they've done in the past. So they started out with programming languages, operating systems, application software. They moved into workgroup server computing and then, you know, high-end data center, server computing, and, uh, and cloud computing. You know, moving from desktop computers to the internet to cloud-based computers is, is a logical progression, right? It's, it's not out of bounds. You know, it's not like they started buying railroads or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Google is a little scattered. Google might buy a railroad. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, Google just got uh, permission for their car that drives itself to drive around in Nevada or something. I and mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, they're all over the map. Um. But, you know, I, I, th- there's a, an approach that the people who founded Google took and, and the co- people who work there take. It reminds me of the Mensa episode of The Simpsons, if you're familiar with that. Mm-hmm. You know, it sounds like a great idea for the smartest people in the community to run the show. Yeah. Uh, but in some ways, people like that are also kind of tunnel vision and short-sighted because they see things through a purely Spock-like, you know, logical um, vision, you know, and, and that's not always the right approach. Um, yeah, I mean, with with any large company like this, uh, they're gonna they're gonna hit two they're gonna hit a wall where they're gonna be way too big and way too scattered, and yeah. they're gonna have to pull the Steve Jobs approach to thing, uh, and and just streamline everything and cut down on most of their products. And it, really, it's hard to do when you're racing to the top. Yeah, see that right. that's the big issue. So, what is their most successful product uh, currently? Their ad revenue, of course, that's where they make all their money. Android yeah, and is then extremely after that, it, you're talking about the little slivers at the bottom of the pie. So, what would be number two? Android. I actually have no idea what is number two. I mean, they they said that. Uh, I think it came out in this court case that through 2010, Google lost money on Android. Uh, I take that to mean they were developing it actively and 
you know, yeah. obviously you're investing at that point. It's kind of it's a little cheap to say they lost money on it, but that's how they described it in the trial. See, I don't. Uh, I, I, last week I predicted uh, with when it, when we were when we started doing this, I don't think Android is going to be a thing that we say anymore. I just think it's going to be powered by Google. I had this uh, notion the other day, and it it came about because of the announcement about that Samsung um, Galaxy 3 phone, which to me yeah. doesn't seem all that impressive. Oh, I know? was going to ask you, what do you think of that? Nothing. Nothing. I, in all. fact, I don't understand. We were all, everyone was so gaga over this thing. Where, you know, it's very exciting, right? Yet another Android phone is coming out. You know, two days later, they announced a new Droid phone, for example. Like these things are just, they're just you're spewing out like baby rabbits now. You know, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> there's nothing about it that's special. By the there's way, like I've a, never heard anybody. There's a Siri ripoff in it, which is everything you need to know about Android in a nutshell. That, you know, none of these people have ever had an original idea in their heads. Um, but it, it occurred to me that someone, and, and by the way, I don't mean, I don't mean like this is Paul being a genius. Lots of people have thought of this. I've, I, I know that people have written articles about this, and maybe we've even discussed this here or there. But it seems like someone could, and by someone I mean like a Samsung or even an Amazon, uh, due to the due to the Android phone market, what the Kindle Fire did to the tablet market, which is yes, well, you know, we can use this Android thing on the back end, but let's create something that's really kind of different. And you know, how wonderful would it be if if say Microsoft created a Windows Phone variant that was the Windows Phone UI but ran Android apps and was compatible with that whole ecosystem. Do you think that would ever just, come to that? No, do I think they're going to? No, no, I don't. But I'm just saying there are companies like Samsung and HTC primarily, but Amazon, who's not in the market, for example, that maybe are looking at this and saying, you know, we don't have enough control over this. And in the case of Samsung in particular, they're selling more than anyone else. So... I could almost picture those guys, for better or worse, effectively, we, we call it forking, but I, I don't think it's a little cheap, too, to call it that. But, you know, effectively taking Android in a new direction of their own and saying, yeah, you know, we'll base this on whatever the basic version of Android is right now. See, I, my or, prediction is, Paul, that they're all going to slowly abandon Android. And, and, this, and, and Samsung, well, today's you know story what? came it's, out that Samsung and Intel are working together <laughs> on... A, it's almost better, though, not to abandon it. I mean, you could... Just build off of it. In other words, the, the one core bit of Android that I think is useful is the app compatibility stuff, right? In other words, it, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. By giving away Android, Google is also giving these companies the ability to do their own thing completely. Um, and that Windows Phone thing I just imagined is one of those things that could happen. There's nothing stopping Microsoft from doing that. Uh, you know, if, if Windows Phone... Well, Blackberry the dust and doesn't sell. Blackberry's trying to do that. Blackberry should do that, and actually, they should be more blatant about it. You know, it it, it literally should be like, look, this is an Android device, but built on top of that Android thing that lets lets you run all those apps, is our custom UI, which is going to differentiate it, and more important, all of those uh, Blackberry Enterprise services that are very important to corporations and governments, and and then you have a differentiated product. You know, it's like the best of both worlds. Yeah, the the, the whole scatterness of Android, uh, in my opinion, in 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 the coming years, is going to slowly start biting it in its ass, mm -hmm. and people are going to start abandoning it. Especially, we don't even know what they're going to do with this Motorola, Motorola mobility you know, front. That's another major conflict of interest. If I'm Samsung or I'm HTC, yeah. so yep. you just bought my competition, and how are you not going to play favorites at this point? Android is successful for the same reason that Windows was successful 20 years ago or 20, 30 years ago, whatever it was, 25 years ago, um, because consumers have a variety of products to choose from, from a variety of companies, a lot of choice. Yeah, but we'll also uh, let's look at what happened with Microsoft in you know the, the mid to, let's say, late 90s when there was so much to choose from and half of them were crap. I mean, we had so yeah, no, many. No, Android's there. It's already there. There's no doubt yeah, about no, it. Yeah, no, they but are, I mean, yeah. But you know the diff there were many there were some differences. First of all, Microsoft never bought a PC company. They never bought Dell. You know, so you've got that going on with Android right now. And uh, Google bought is buying Motorola Mobility. That's strange. Uh, it's a different situation. Um, also, Microsoft didn't give away Windows. You know, Windows was always the low cost option. But even by the late '90s, early 2000s, I mean, Linux was around. It was no longer the lowest cost option. I mean, by that point, it had established itself. I think. I think the application compatibility 
uh, and you know it's inroads in the enterprise. There were lots of reasons probably on the Windows side, but we're we're kind of keys to it continuing to be successful even when a free version was available in the smartphone market. The free version has already taken off, so I don't think there's any stopping it. See, I think the 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 sheer dominance of Google will come into play when almost every TV and I th I don't think the phone yeah. is going to be what they're going to capture. I think the television is going to be. The, right. Their major, major uh, source of revenue because they'll probably end up doing some sort of uh, deals with the cable companies, the television companies. Uh, they'll and start it will be, subsidizing by the way, it will be Google Hulu. doing that deal. It will be it, Google it doing that It won't be deal. an Android OEM. And I think yeah. that's the key. You know, when you look at how Google has approached the tablet market, where, by the way, it has not done well, and how they're approaching, or how I believe they're approaching the TV market, it's not like with Android on the phone, right? Android on the phone, everyone can have it. Every, anyone can have it. Uh, and all those devices come out and all that kind of stuff. I think what you're saying with the TV is it's going to be Google, you know, uh, Google TV. Uh, it, yeah, it's going to be a Google it's TV. It's Bob's TV based on Google TV. No, it's no. Google yeah. TV. And what where they're going to create their revenues, not necessarily from licensing the product, but the subsidizing of services like Hulu and Netflix or whatever it is, where to the point where I, I honestly think that we're going to have, start seeing subsidized televisions. Uh, and this kind of goes into what the Xbox has become at this point. You're getting a subsidized Xbox for signing a two-year deal. We are going to start seeing things like this because my, because Google has the power to oh. do this. Uh, <laughs> they're going to be able to cut deals. So Google Music, Google TV will be you know HBO, Showtime, and you pay a monthly fee and you get a rate on the TV. The only issue there, I mean, well, of course, you know, uh, Apple did this in the in the smartphone market, the cell phone market, where they came in where they were established players. It's very hard, you know, to, uh, as an outsider, to enter one of these markets where they have entrenched competitors and, you know, companies that sort of compete and cooperate as well. Uh, Microsoft really tried very hard over a decade ago, 15 years ago, to get into this market with set-top boxes and failed miserably. But see, this is uh, why Microsoft failed, and it's the same reason why they failed with Windows Mobile. It's because they took a, they, they didn't look at it as, you doing a television experience, they took it as putting a computer in a TV. <laughs> and, and that's, well, I mean, they tried with yeah. web TV, and, and I know at one point it wasn't that awful. I remember using one at someone's house. Oh, no, they have them today. They're still not awful. And it they're, wasn't they're awful. Actually, they're actually nice. The problem is that they did it right at the height of the US antitrust stuff. And those guys were like, no, 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 no. We don't want Microsoft running roughshod over this industry like they did over the PC industry. Screw them. And all of the major cable provider players basically Bailed, yeah. kept them out of the market. Yeah, um, Google could face that today, except for one thing. I mean, the interesting thing is, even though they may look at Google and see the same thing, the same issue, the world has changed, right? It's not 2000 anymore. It's 2012. People are already getting entertainment options online through Netflix and through these other services. Yeah. And the cable providers today may be saying, you know what? We need to invite some of these guys into the party because we're going to be left on the outside. It's you know when I grew up, we had three channels on TV plus a couple of UHS channels. UHF. Yeah, like UHF. the four Spanish stations on uh, UHF. Right. That was about and then it. cable came out and Fox. I think we talked about this last yeah. week. Yeah. Uh, and all that stuff and it kind of exploded and it, and the, the the options that my kids have for entertainment today are, are off the charts. It's just amazing. I mean, just YouTube alone, right, Paul? I mean, yeah. you could spend hours on there and but my son literally spends hours on YouTube, I believe. Yeah. And it doesn't even need to be a television show. I mean, I'm sure your son sits there and does walkthroughs of video games and yep. just yep. Peop people just playing the game and and that's a source of entertainment. Are our opinion of, of good content and bad content is kind of different now. It's a lot of amateur content. It's a lot know, of that, amateur content. By the content. way, that ties into what we've been talking about, this notion that you know, with sports and with other media that people who are amateurs, people we might consider podcasters today or whatever, uh, could have a very bright future in broadcasting or as, you know, as we think of it today. Because this stuff is going to change. Well, and I think Paul, this is perfect all example. part of the same theme. Perfect example. Revision 3 which is yep. one of the largest web television networks, just got bought by Discovery for $30 which is, million. Dollars. Yeah. Which is not an interesting pairing. And I, I, I'm not really quite, quite clear on what those guys had in common with Discovery. I think I know what they're going to do. Okay. They're, they're going to uh, either, it goes into two, two places. I, I've heard that Discovery, because their whole thing is they just have these niche channels at this point. Yep. What if they put a Discovery Tech channel? Because we already have science. We have all these other 
channels that we have, how much would it cost Discovery just to sub out the content from Revision 3 and possibly uh, yeah. they own, I, mean, I think, I, I, a honestly, lot of Honestly, I don't shows. think there's a big future for a, a tech-only channel, but they already have Discovery, you know, the Discovery channels we already know about. Um, I could see them using tech shows as filler or having a tech show night, you know, on one Disco of those on Discovery Science or something. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. $30 million, it's a lot yeah. of money for, for a, a web TV company. You know, that's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. Of course, and it's, it listen, it makes me really happy because then I, I could say like, hey, look, these guys got bought for 30 million. Sure. Where is AOL? Not, or is AOL knocking on my door? <laughs> That'll be the day. That'll Sayonara, nice. suckers. Yeah. Put a bit of put a big sticker up. We'll not come back. <laughs> Going out of business. <laughs> Just take off. Yep. You know, I did that for for, uh, for April Fool's. I um, sent a tweet out saying that AOL bought me. Nice. And. I, one of these news, like tech news sites, one of the ones that you're not really a big fan of, sent me an email asking me to confirm our sale for $10 million to AOL. Fantastic. And I really wanted to say, yes, we got bought for $10 million from AOL. I confirm it, but I thought I would burn that bridge. So I said, no, it's an April Fool's thing. There you go. So 10 mil. I mean, I could potentially be bought for 10 mil. Revision 3 should be worth 400 million at that point. But it, 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 it does show you that well, what if, you know, Discovery went to Google and said, hey, yeah. you know, we want to put our content on Google. And yep. they actually, they literally paid Google to have their content on a Google TV. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, yeah, I, I really think that In might other words, be the future right. So they have content that uh, you could watch on cable channels, but you could stream them to Google TV through a, an app or however they organize it these days on Google TV. I, I, you know, the whole notion of advertising and creating revenue and monetizing any type of product is v really going to change over the next 10 years. Yep. I think the traditional way of putting an ad, especially for media, putting an ad, creating ad revenue from the ad, and then, you know, paying the bills, that's changing. Especially when content providers now, like let's say a Discovery Channel or, or a Revision 3, are kind of at the mercy of Google and Apple and companies that are not traditionally media companies. Well, but, you know, it's an interesting pairing because Revision 3, like us and, you know, like the uh, the Twit stuff or whatever, is right now constrained by the distribution of the content, right? We, yeah. We're on the Internet. Uh, Discovery, I don't, I'm not sure I'd say they're constrained, but, they, you know, they, they, they're in their business. You know, they're broadcast TV, cable and so forth. They're are probably, you know, they have to get on to different cable providers to ensure that people can get the channels and so forth. And there are packages, and sometimes maybe you pay extra for, for some of them, and sometimes you get them for free with the basic package, whatever. Who knows how that works? But those are two completely different things. You know, I think by combining them, you get the best of both worlds. And, it'll, you know, how awesome would something very high quality like content from Discovery available through, say, like a YouTube channel or Google TV or yeah. whatever make that service right it, it it's just the sheer quality of it you know kind of helps to put that thing over the top well I, one one company and i know you're not a fan of wrestling but uh i was reading a smashable article uh, yeah. a couple of months ago and we're talking about how the wwe has really accepted new media and social media and now they're putting away they're giving away their stuff on youtube they they have a youtube channel they're launching mm -hmm. a network television so it shows the struggle within a company which i find very interesting they're right. launching a television network, and they can't get their act together to launch the television network. So huh. th what they have done in the meantime, they have gone to YouTube. I'm sure they're getting paid by Google to do this. Yeah. Yeah. They're putting special everyday content on their YouTube channel. So you could go there every day and see behind-the-scenes stuff. The, the wrestlers are hosting shows. So now you've created an online channel. Right. And they're getting millions of views for these videos, uh, and and you and Google, I'm sure, is paying them a piece to license, you know, the brand on their channel. This is so tragic on so many levels. Oh, it, it, it's it, it's amazing what's happening. So, how do you justify? And this is this is maybe the audience could help out with this. How do you justify spending? Let's say, let's say they're giving them a million dollars to do this. How do you justify giving them a million dollars compared to? Well, let's say a video that I make and, and let's say like a regular YouTube guy and, and they're making maybe, you know, a half a million views per episode. Yeah, but I, see, I think that is the answer right there. I, I, these guys are a guaranteed audience 
with known advertisers who might follow them there and be happy to be paying a lot less per whatever it is online than they pay for on TV. So they have a big audience and I think that's what it is. It's where the numbers are. You know, you can, I don't know, I, there must be ads on these videos, right? Or uh, Google has uh, dynamic ad serving capabilities. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could picture even like the, like what we do here and you kind of syndicate it through some kind of a web, you know, channel or whatever, um, interspersed with ads. I mean, it becomes like a TV channel. You could, you could. It's not hard to imagine. No, it's not. And and you know, uh, we're on different platforms. We're on Stickham. We're on UStream. We're on Justin TV. We're on. Mm. Uh, we have an audio feed, and they're able to create revenue based on our content. I don't get any money from them, but they put ads on our videos. Right. My revenue comes from you know sponsors that literally just pay me. Uh, pay the network to talk about their product. And uh, I, I think that's actually a very good time to talk about a product. And look <laughs> at that segue. Let's talk about Hover.com. Uh, I lost track of time, Paul. Look at that. We're having fun. And, and this is what happens when we have too much fun here on the show. Uh, Hover.com is simply the best domain registrar. I have over almost over 200 domains. I think it's like 201 domains. I may have a problem at this point. But uh, they, they have a very clean UI. Very easy to purchase. You're not going to get bombarded with emails reminding you and emails trying to upsell you different products. They do domains and they do it right. If you go to gfq.hover.com, you get 10% off your entire purchase. Or you could use promo code WTT upon checkout and get that uh, 10% off your purchase. Uh, Hover.com, domain names made simple. Thank you, Hover, for supporting What the Tech. Uh, But back to the discussion, Paul. Now... I do want to go to the Xbox story. Mm -hmm. Uh, The $99 subsidized Xbox 360, and they're just selling it, but you have to get a two-year contract for the live service, the gold account. I saw on your website on winsupersite.com, you're not a huge fan of this. Well, with the understanding that some people simply can't afford to pay for this thing, right? Uh, an Xbox 360 with Connect Bundle, the exact hardware you get as part of this deal, is $300, right? So if you can't afford that, $99 is less than $300. $300 and, yeah. you know, uh, I think it's, yeah, $15 a month doesn't sound too bad, you know, for two years. Um, you're basically just paying a little, you know, more than you would otherwise over a period of time, which is a very common way to buy things, right? But it's a very common way to buy things that are really expensive, right? like yeah, sure. car, cars and houses. I mean, the, the problem with the monthly payment thing is that these things kind of add up, you know, and I, I don't like this trend. It, it's a it's something that Microsoft tried in the past with Office where they, you know, because from Microsoft's perspective, having a little bit of money come in regularly every single month is way better than having a lot of money now and no money for two years. Yeah. And this is really their goal. Um, and I, you know, obviously someone could make the argument that this kind of a payment plan helps them because it gets them something they can't otherwise afford. But what if you're already going to get the live service? Is it worth it then? I mean, a lot of people go out there and they get the, no, 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 no. I mean, no, (laughs) because you can pay 60 bucks and get a year of Xbox live gold. So that's $120. And then the bundle was, uh, uh, I think it was two ninety nine. Okay, so, so sixty bucks for a year, and this is going to cost you one hundred and fifty bucks a year. So when you when you do this Microsoft ninety nine dollar thing, which is all, by the way only available in Microsoft retail stores, so it's limited to about a dozen cities around the United States. So you can only do it where there is a physical store. Um, so it's not available to everyone. It's just it's like a test run. I think it will be pretty popular. So it's sixty um, bucks for the year for the gold account, right? So you're paying, you're paying, you're paying, wow, you're paying a lot more. You're paying $90 more a month, a year. Well, no, no, it's not that bad. So the, it's, it's, uh, let's see, let's do It's 15 bucks a month. 15 15 a month. Times 24. Okay. Is 360 360. plus 100 is 460. Okay. So you're paying $460. Versus 420 if you just bought the stuff. Okay. So you're. Overpaying by forty dollars, which over two years, by the way, is not a lot of money. You know, yeah. it's not it's not a lot of money, but you know, it, it contributes, I think, to a, an issue with you know, again, all this monthly payment stuff. You ever you know look at your bills and and, and say, when when did I sign up for all this stuff? Like, you, 
I've got this and this and this and you know you're, all these things I think kind of add up. Um, I tend to, you know, when we buy stuff, we buy stuff we can actually afford. We pay cash or uh, as cash like as possible. We don't run like a credit card debt on something or whatever. Um, I think a lot of people are getting used to th this whole idea where you know I pay like three ninety nine a month and I have this service. Um, I know, I know they are. I know they are. But see, we were talking about Google TV and one of the possible ways in which this thing could take off. It, when you add this thing into another bill, th that's a, a benefit of ways. For example, we pay uh, certain amounts of money every month for our wireless bill, you know, for uh, cell phones and smartphones. We pay so much a month for cable internet. We pay so much a month for, you know, cable TV and so forth and phones. We have phones and that. Um, wireless will combine all four of those things into one bill. And you actually yeah. save money by doing that and so forth and everything. It's still a monthly bill. I mean, you're not going to escape monthly bills. Monthly bills are a fact of life. But um, there are ways to do it intelligently where you actually save money. And I, I think that this type of thing benefits Microsoft. And I guess it benefits the type of people who couldn't afford this thing in the first place. But ultimately, for to really to benefit a lot of people, it needs to be better for everyone overall. And I think one yeah. of the ways it could be better is if this or Google TV or something like that could be rolled into something you're already paying and then it becomes a true savings to you. You know, if this thing worked out where you would actually pay less for this thing but pay for it for 2 years. Yeah, I mean that, that's, a, that's well, a different story. That's not really how that's That's works. not the, yeah, they, I mean they want to make more money. It's like Well, I mm. actually I don't think it's about more money. I think it's really about making more money or money consistently over time. I really do think it's about that, not about the amount. I'm trying to think who they're targeting, and I'm sure they're targeting, you know, college kids and 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 just high yeah. school kids that. Well, no, uh, listen, we're we're, we're <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, we're, I'm trying to do the math on the years here. We are in the seventh year of a product that should have been in the market for about five years. So, this generation of video game consoles has has lived in the market far longer than anyone ever anticipated. This is bonus time for Microsoft and for the other companies. All of the, well, maybe not in the case of Xbox, but most of the money that they put into this has been paid back. This is gravy time. The problem is the video game market is doing less well now than it was a year ago, right? Things are going downhill. It's not just yeah. because there aren't new consoles. It's, it has a lot to do with the fact that people are gaming in different ways than they were five, six, seven years ago. We have Facebook games. We have iPod, iPhone, yeah, the iPad games, all that stuff. Our, our idea for game has totally changed. Uh, yeah. If, the, if, well, they're trying to convince people to buy something maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. I think that's the point of it. In other words, either because it's too late in the cycle or I already have an Xbox 360 and I, you know, I really don't play games that way anymore. And, you know, this is like $99. That's like a magic price point. You know, people are like, oh, wait, wait, what, what am I getting here? Because, you know, they don't even Xbox know. They'll buy Connect it. isn't video games. It's all the other stuff, too. Yeah, I mean, if you, the Xbox was what, $399 when it came out? Yeah. You know, and now it's your, your $300 but less. But here is the interesting part to me. So if I were to get this device, $99, bucks, plus, you know, the $15.99 a month you're paying for the live, uh, Xbox Live, uh, I guess, account. You're going to pay $7.99 for Netflix. You're going to pay another $7.99 for Hulu. You're paying $32 a month right. for this device. Yeah. And by the way, and if you want to do it right. So in other words, if your goal is to access those services, you would be way better bad. off buying a Roku device or even an Apple TV and just utilizing that stuff. Right? $99 or less, one-time fee, no subscription cost. I mean, obviously, you're still going to pay for Netflix, but... You know, with the Xbox, you're paying for Netflix in addition to yeah. Xbox. Well, you, you 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 need an Xbox Live in order to get Netflix, right? Gold, yeah. You need an Xbox Gold account, yep. yeah. So it's automatically you know going to cost you X amount of money. I, I don't know for thirty two bucks a month, maybe there's somebody out there that doesn't really necessarily need TV service, and they're going to get this, and this is going to be their television. So then they, I could kind of justify yeah. it. Sure. I could justify the $99 price tag. So you pay 99 bucks, use this as your media device, and now you have Hulu and you have Netflix. This might be good enough for you. It might. I mean, ultimately, I think this is really just about, this is part of Microsoft's plan to uh, squeak out another year of the 360. You know, I think this is part of it. We'll see how it goes. You know, I think they're, they're test marketing it. We'll see if it's popular. I suspect it will be. Well, the next uh, generation, I mean, the rumors are heating up again. I know they said they're not going to really unveil anything at E3, but 
you're right. They got seven years out of a device that should have they, they should have gotten two uh, five years out of. Right. So where do they go from here? They got to drop the price. Um, and yeah. what does this mean for the next one? Will this hurt the next generation? If if people are getting used to this ninety nine dollar price tag with an Xbox, mm. what's going to happen when the next generation Xbox comes out and it's you know three ninety nine? I, I have no reason to believe this, but uh, you know there have been rumors about there being a non-video game version of the Xbox Next, whatever it's called, and that it would be a really low-end set-top box that would just provide those media services. Yeah, but that's that's like if Sony released a DVD player, you know, which they do, but they they release a Sony, you know, the PlayStation DVD player instead of the PlayStation uh, <laughs> console. Well, like, uh, it, okay, but except that Microsoft has spent a lot of time building up an apps platform for the Xbox 360 and people have written those apps for this platform. So uh, that thing does exist. And, and supposedly, as of right now, uh, more people are using the 360 to do non-video game related entertainment services than they are to play video games. So what would be cool is if they release like something. That makes some sense. Yeah, I mean, they could release something that says, okay, you only have downloadable content. Like a, well, what do you mean? Like a... Like you get you get access to the Xbox Live Arcade and that's it. That's all you get access to. Like a streaming, all. like an online type. Yeah, service. almost like an online sure. service, but it's very limited. The type of games you're gonna you're not gonna play, you know, uh, Call of know, Duty. Call of Duty. On Although there. by this point, you will be able to play Call of Duty. <laughs> you know, yeah, the I old know. version probably. I, I find uh, this. I yeah, find sure. This, why not? I, I think that's a great idea. And where does this leave Sony? You know, if we're if we're talking about the place at this point, nobody's talking about Sony. Yeah, they, nobody, well, so Sony has their own, you know, Steve Jobs style restructuring that they need to do right now, which um, they're trying so we'll, to now. Yeah, we'll see. You know, Sony has squandered uh, lots of time and lots of assets that, you know, could have worked well together. You know, they own a music company. Uh, they could have made music device. They should have made the iPod by all, you know, uh, by any sense. Did, of I, normalcy, did I tell you the story? Didn't. I, which they do. And this is a funny story. And I think I said it once on the air. I worked for a Japanese company and this and the vice president of the company, his brother was in charge. He was like VP of Sony Japan and their, and their MP3 division. Yep. He created it. I mean, he designed their Sony Walkman MP3. Mm -hmm. And he knew there was a big problem when he gave the Sony Walkmans to his entire family, like the Sony MP3 players. This is a couple of years ago. And yeah. all the kids were disappointed that they didn't get an iPad, an iPod. Sure. And they, 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 they were almost shocked that they didn't get an iPod. And he was, you know, I was talking to the guy and he goes, my, my, uh, my brother said he knew they were in big trouble when their family, people that these right. are people that work at Sony, they were upset that they didn't get an iPod. They ended up all, and they all ended up getting an iPod. They wouldn't even use their product. <laughs> well, you, by the way, you see this at the Microsoft campus, you walk around there. I mean, everyone has iPhones and Apple, you see Apple laptops and stuff. I mean, when when that stuff invades into, you know, there. There's a problem. Uh, yeah, there's a problem. <laughs> I, I, you know, problem. I would love to know how many people are using a Windows phone at the Apple campus. Well, none. None. Right? None. Yeah. Of course. I mean, I, I'm sure they have a few Windows for competitive research purposes. And so yeah. Forth. Yeah. It, it's it's an interesting thing. I mean, how to how it goes yep. into that. Now, I, I do want to talk about one thing. I'm considering an ultrabook. Yep. Uh, the reason why I'm I'm considering an ultrabook is because my wife has a uh, an old ThinkPad at this point. Well, it's, it's a couple years old. I mean, it's a big, clunky laptop. I mean, those ThinkPads are built to last. And she was she was asking me. She's like, "Well, do you think we should get an ultrabook?" Because mm -hmm. she saw one of the commercials, and I want to discuss it with you on the air. And I'm sure many of our viewers think the same way. Is yeah. it something to buy right now? Yeah, I mean, right, right now, obviously, we're in the middle of a transition from the current. Uh, generation of Intel processors to the next gen, and I think the the chips that will be in Ultrabooks aren't out quite yet. I mean, they'll be out in June or whatever. Um, I you know I I have an Ultrabook. I have one of the Asus. Um, I guess like a UX30 is the model. Um, I love it because it is so thin and light. I can throw that thing in my bag, and it it's like it doesn't. It weighs three pounds. I mean, it's crazy um, how excellent it is. Um, for me personally, it's uh, the keyboard is terrible. So if you're used to a, a ThinkPad keyboard like I am, you move to this thing, it's like, it's awful. You know, it's okay. just a terrible keyboard. If you, but I type a lot. You know, so that type of thing might not be an issue for most people. Um, there are a handful of Ultrabooks that are out right now that are probably good to choose between. I, I think she liked the ZenBook. 
Yeah, that's the one I have. Yeah, okay, that the newer yeah. one. They just the refreshed one? it. Yeah. So the, the the one that just came out has a couple of improvements, but the big improvement is it has a backlit keyboard. Um, and that is something I wish I had, you know, had been available. It wasn't available in the version. I told I my wife, I'm like, why don't you just get an Air? And she absolutely hates Apple. She hates yeah. the Mac. She, she, I mean, she has an iPhone. She loves it, but she hates. Yeah. So the, I have, a, I have a MacBook Air as well. I have to say, I actually like the ZenBook better. Uh, it, and part of it is because it, obviously it's made for Windows, and and I prefer Windows on there. Period. Anyway, but. Um, it gets great battery life. Um, it has a USB 3.0 port uh, that also does the charging when the machine's off and all that. So um, it's it's nice. It's just a nice machine. I'm at Asus's website right now. Um, so what you should do though, if you're if you're shopping, I I always recommend LaptopMag.com. Uh, they have a lot of annoying ads, <laughs> but um, they are a fantastic site for portable computing. Period. And I I really do trust those guys. I know a few of them uh, now, but. Um, I, I would trust their reviews. I just want to say Asus has to have one of the worst websites on the face of the planet. Yes, they do. Uh, uh, but, I mean, well, second only to HP, by the way. Se- well, you HP's know what, though? Here's the thing. True. HP works. Like, the HP website, when you go there, it works. The Asus website, mm. and I'll tell you, this is dating back <laughs> to the late 90s. Right. It has never worked. The Asus US website, I have to go to the global website in order to download drivers. And this is something that has plagued this company for, for a decade at this point. And I'm baffled that they have not fixed it. Right. I, I don't understand how difficult it is for the company to have a website that functions <laughs> I, I, properly. I, I, I can't speak to the quality of the website, but I bought, uh, you know, the, because the Asus computers are not configurable, I just bought this from Amazon, you know, when I bought that. If I were going to buy an HP computer, I would buy it from HP.com and I would configure it. You know, assuming it was configurable. The other thing that's interesting right now with um, Ultrabooks is they're starting to come up with 15-inch uh, Ultrabooks, which is very, very attractive to me personally because I, I prefer the bigger screen with the higher resolution. You don't like the 13-inch? 13's okay. 11 is completely unacceptable. I, I 11 is too small for me. Yeah. Um, but I, I just like the extra real estate. And, you know, when you move up to a 15-inch laptop, I mean, those things are enormous and heavy, and I would hate to carry that around. But... A 15-inch Ultrabook, you know, that starts to get interesting. The, I think the only one that's out now might be that Samsung, which isn't reviewed. The Series no, 9? Yeah, it's, it's not quite high enough, uh, high, highly rated enough for me to even consider. Now, do you, think, do you think the fact that, you know, we've been talking about the Ultrabooks for almost two years now, but the adaptation by the manufacturers has been very so Do you, do you base that because of Intel? Uh, and their chipset being delayed, or do you think they just they're not able to just do it? What was delayed? Uh, because the chipset, the uh, the new chip was delayed for a while. The Ivory Bridge chip, it was supposed to come well, out. Well, the desktop a while version's ago. out now, and and uh, you can actually, as of today, buy regular laptops that have the Ivory Bridge chipset. But I think the Alter, yeah, the Alterbrook ones um, next month. I mean, it has an SSD. It's not bad. I, I, do you yeah. pick this over a MacBook Air? I mean I that, do, yeah. that's that's the yeah. that's the, the big I mean, problem look, that they're going to face. Let's be clear. This thing wouldn't exist without the MacBook Air. There's no doubt about it. The style similarities between these two devices, uh, there's no doubt about it. It's got really high res. I mean, the 13-inch version, it's uh, 1600 by 900. Um, I, I, I've traveled with it a bunch already. I just, I, I think I only bought it in January or something. I don't remember, but I've, I've, tra- I've made a bunch of trips with it. I love traveling with this thing in. It's when I get there, it's a little. I mean, I almost wish I had a keyboard I could you know, plug into it. The keyboard's not great, but again, I write a lot, and I think for most people, that's not going to be an issue. So, once you remove that, is like my one big issue with this thing. It's like the rest of it's great. I think the biggest problem that they're going to face is how uh, many of these websites are always going to refer to these things, or for the time being, they're going to refer to, to them as MacBook clones. Yeah. It, Air well, look, so uh, how do you no, how do you break there's that? There's no escaping it. And yeah. and some of the ultrabook makers are more blatant about that than others. You know, uh, and this is a good example. The uh, the Asus is one that it, look it's <laughs> it's a MacBook Air you know made by Asus, but and they're uh, not cheap. I don't know. It's nine ninety nine. Nine ninety nine. So how much is a MacBook Air at this point? Let me see. The thirteen inch like yeah. this would be like fifteen hundred bucks probably. Let me see. Apple dot com. Mac. Twelve ninety nine or somewhere in there. Let's see. Air. Uh nine ninety nine. 
starting. No, but that's an 11 inch. Is that the 11? Okay. Yeah. You click buy now. I like how they, you don't have an option to like search. It's, oh, it's buy now. Right. So 13 inch with a 128, four gigs. Yeah. So roughly the same is 12.99. But uh, that computer doesn't have, what's the difference? It's going to be the screen resolution, I think. It's probably 14. Yeah. The Mac is 1440 by 900. So actually, do I have the display right? I think it's 1600. I want to say it's 1600 by 900. 128 hard drive. Yeah, that's the same, I think, on the one I have. See, I don't think people understand, and this is going to be the thing. Does the mainstream, when they go to buy a computer, is the mainstream thinking Windows, Mac, or are they thinking, wow, it's pretty? I think they're just thinking, wow, it's pretty. Well, I hope they're taking a little more thought than that. <laughs> I, mean, I really, I, I, like I've I lost said, all I hope. Prefer... I've lost all hope in the in the mainstream consumer. I, I yeah. really have, and and I deal with a lot of clients, and and I, you know, a lot of my relatives come to me and they ask me things, and I've lost total hope that people buy things because they know about it. I think they just buy it because they know someone with it. They don't. They know nothing about it. I have a relative that bought a Mac, and they didn't understand that it has a different operating system. They're like, well, how come this doesn't have Windows? They literally said, how come this, this doesn't have Windows? And I explained, I'm like, well, it's an Apple product. They go, I thought it's all the same thing. All right. Actually, you know, by the way, the new version of this um, Asus is an i7 processor, um, not an i5. It doesn't have an i5. Okay. So it's like it's, it, the processor is also better. Yeah, I mean, listen, you're gonna you're gonna get a little bit of a better price with it. Um, a little bit. Well, a lot. <laughs> like, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna get a good like price. I think what drives it better. <laughs> what drives the price is the SSD, really. Yeah. If 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 it didn't have an SSD and had a traditional hard drive, uh, you would be talking a, a few hundred dollars less. I'm well, sure. Yeah, but it also wouldn't be as thin. And I think it wouldn't be as thin. An SSD yeah, yeah, that that's the issue that it's facing. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I'm gonna I'm, I'll wait. I mean, for the Ivory Bridge ones, but. You know, Lenovo's uh, got a ThinkPad Ultrabook coming out, and Lenovo also sells Ultrabooks that are IdeaPad branded, uh, which are okay. Um, but I, I don't think the ThinkPad Ultrabook is coming out until the end of the year or later in the year, and it's going to be kind of a, um, obviously, like a business-oriented thing too. So yeah, it may not be. Uh, Paul, it is. Uh, we're going to play our 10-year game. Okay. Uh, but before we do, I do want to talk about our sponsor, and that's Audible.com. Uh, they support the show, and you should support them. If you go to audibletrial.com slash GFQ, you qualify for a free audio book. Uh, each week, Paul and I have a pick, a, uh, an audible pick, and, of course, Paul's picks are much better than mine each week because uh, Paul is Paul's really good at things. Yeah, Paul's very good at things. Uh, Paul, what is your audible pick this week? Um we're going to be swimming in books about Steve Jobs and Apple for the next 12 months. But, and, and some of them are great and some of them, most of them are not. But, um, you know, obviously the Steve Bi Jobs biography is great. Um, this is the only other book I've read in kind of the post Steve Jobs stuff that's about him and about Apple that I think is truly great. Um, it's called Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple's Success. It's by Ken Siegel. Um, he worked for the advertising company that uh, did Apple's ads back in the day when Steve Jobs was on board. And then again later now in the more recent time period when he came back. And uh, so he was able to see Steve Jobs firsthand and how he handled things. And uh, it, it, it's it's almost like a like a business book where it talks about how you can apply these themes of simplicity to your own business. Um, and that stuff is actually very interesting. I tend to hate that kind of stuff. But uh, interesting insights into Apple and Steve Jobs and also into how you can use uh, the same techniques to improve things. And, and, you know, by the way, he compares uh, the way that Apple's website sells Macs versus how HP's does it and how abysmal HP's is compared to Apple. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there um, that is just, I, I think, brilliant. And, and, and Steve Jobs, of course, is, is a very peculiar guy and, and a person who was just um, bereft of the social norms we all have, was able to or just did this stuff as part of his life without exception. It was just the way he was to the, to the tune where he would walk into a meeting, didn't know who one of the people was asked who it was. And when finding out that she was the new person who was going to be representing the iMac at the advertising agency, had told her to leave because he didn't know who she was and he couldn't care less who she was. Yeah. You know, he had a meeting to run and, um, it's a fascinating book, it, both from the perspective of just the Steve Jobs stuff, which I know a lot of people, uh, um, for some reason, idolize the guy, but, also, um, 
I, I think the truly important bit about Steve Jobs and Apple was their just in, incredible push for simplicity uh, at all times, in all ways. Um, actually, I'll give you one story. Let me give you yeah, one story. Yeah, go ahead. I actually think this is a great story. Um, Apple has a product um, called Final Cut Studio, right? So there was a guy working on the new version of that at one point a couple of years ago, and they, were gonna, they had bought a company, I think that was called Color, and they wanted to sell it in a premium version of the product. So this guy spent weeks working on presentations and rationale for doing this and explaining it and how, the, how this, the advertising it could fall within Apple's simplicity stuff and on and on and on it went. He, he, he was all prepared for this. He knew how Steve Jobs was. He knew how the guy was going to react. And he was prepared for every question. And he went into this meeting and he started his little spiel and Steve Jobs said, stop, put it in the box. And he said, what? And he said, just put it in the box. He said, let's move on to the next thing. And the guy was like, well, wait a second. We're, you know, we can have two versions. He goes, no, we have one version. Put it in the box. We're done. And then the guy's weeks of prep preparation went down the tubes. Down the tubes. And, and, you and see, you know, this is the exact opposite of Microsoft's approach, right? Microsoft has all these different SKUs of Windows. Windows 8, they have this supposedly simplified view of it. But really with Windows 8, what you see is Windows 8, Windows 8 Pro, Windows 8 Enterprise is like a China version of it, as well as starter version or whatever. There's there's an, a Pro Pack add-on that people can buy to get Windows Media Center, and then DVD. Oh, you want DVD playback? That's an that's an additional add-on, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. And you know, Microsoft, uh, like any good liar, you know, the more they babble and talk, the more you realize what they're really up yeah, to. Yeah. And they talk and they talk and they talk and they talk and they talk. And on the Apple side, Apple's response to this kind of thing is, no, just put it in the box. Yeah. Uh, That's here's the a difference clip. Between I can't pull up the screen for whatever reason. Uh, my Mac does not <laughs> want to work. It, it, surprisingly, when uh, when you're talking about Steve Jobs, it decided yep. that it's not going to display the video. But uh, here's the audio clip from... Uh, oh, the read audio. by the author, too. Read right. by the author. The guy who really invented this. Macintosh was the first computer to popularize it. When Steve Jobs took the stage to announce Macintosh in 1984, he used words that would resonate for decades to come. He called it insanely great. It was the kind of insanity that caused people to line up around the block to get a closer look at this technology milestone. When Steve returned to Apple after 11 years in exile, so did the insanity, and the line started forming once again. First, he reignited computers, iMac. Then he revolutionized music, iPod and iTunes. I just want to say the iMac was not a great computer. <laughs> no, I actually it's funny you say that because I I supported those computers um, and I hated them uh, for various reasons. You know but what was even it, worse? The eMac. Yeah. Well, actually, well, the eMac was okay. Um, the, you know, the mouse was terrible, <laughs> obviously, and that actually this I believe is in this book. That was one of the you know mistakes, and uh, one of the things that they talk about in this book is how how you fix mistakes, you know, and that mouse didn't last very long, let's put it that way. And they, they knew uh, as soon as it was out in the world. That was a mistake. That was a, it was what Apple's critics thought it was, which was design or form over function. Yeah. It's great. I'm going to actually grab this book. It's a great book. Yeah, I'm going to download it right it, now. If anything, actually. it's too short. You know, uh, seven hours. So, yeah, it's a little short. Uh, it, was, it just came out, too, uh, yeah, it's brand this new. month. So, definitely check it out. Uh, insanely Simple. The Obsession That Drives Apple's Success. Uh, Audible.com. You can download it. I'm going to download this actually right now while we're talking. And uh, your pick is so good that I'm not even going to do mine. I'm going to say mine for next week, Paul. All righty. You your picks are always better than mine, and I feel embarrassed. Well, I, I, I don't know. You, you top me. You, this you is a really me. good one. And, and, you know, it's tough. We, we talk about technology, and um, I don't know what it is, but there aren't many great technology books, especially recently. And, um, you know, obviously there's marketing stuff in here and, and, and in some ways it's a business book. Well, the story's uh, fascinating. I th the story's you know, amazing. I, I actually just think this is a great book across the board. I think anyone who listens to this. I mean, regardless uh, of what you think of Steve Jobs, uh, he was a fascinating guy. Yeah, uh, no, and, I, I, and the Apple yeah. story is extremely fascinating to anybody. I mean, even people who don't like Apple products, you know, they're, they're on the other side of this, this PC versus Mac thing. The fact that this company was, was dead... Nobody wants to go near them, and they've become the largest yep. uh, electronic company in the world at this point. Everybody has an iPod. Everybody has an iPhone. People yep. are buying Macs just because they, they want to buy Macs. It's become a part of our culture at this point, regardless of where you stand on this. So it's a sure. very no, fascinating no, the guy, thing. He was a jerk, but you know, it, sometimes it takes a jerk <laughs> to 
push through the types of, you know, simplicity initiatives that other companies just aren't brave enough to do. And Apple has one of the best, best PR departments in the face of the planet. I mean, just they could they could sell anything and convince <laughs> millions of people that they need this thing. I, and I really and I I'll probably get a lot of emails calling me an idiot for this. But I think if, if Microsoft released the iPad exactly for what it is. Sure. But it was named the Microsoft blank and it wasn't the Apple product, I don't think we would have the success that we do today with this product. I, don't, I think a lot of it has to do with the Apple PR machine and, and literally the cult of Mac. I, I don't, do you th- what do you think of that, Paul? Do you think Microsoft were to release the iPad the, the way it is? Microsoft could never have released it. But let's say they did. Let's say they released so they, it. They couldn't They have. couldn't, I, yeah. No, Microsoft, there would have been, you know. The Microsoft I, I, I Windows kinda, tablet I take PC. Apple to task for having all these different memory versions and Wi-Fi or only 3G. That would just be the start of it if it was Microsoft. There would be a pro version and a plus version. There would be a version that came with a keyboard. You know, Enterprise. Microsoft is about committee. Microsoft is about pleasing everyone. Microsoft is a place where everyone has a voice. And anyone can stop something from actually happening. And, you know, I, I, it, it's not fair to say that the way Apple does things is perfect for all businesses or for all circumstances and that it always works. That's not the point. But sometimes you need a maniac who has the final say and is going to push everything through. And unfortunately, even in companies like Microsoft, where Steven Sanofsky is kind of uh, trying to emulate that style, ultimately, you're still dealing with an enormous bureaucracy, yeah. both at the company itself and just also in the user base, where it's just a, such a diverse group of users, and you listen to all of them, and you, and you compromise, you know? Yeah. And uh, it, it's just a fact of life. I, I, I think, I, I really also think, re, let's, I mean, to, to play on this, if they were to come up with a product, there. It really was the hype machine behind Apple and the fact that, you know, anything that Apple puts out and most of the time, I mean, they're putting out great products regardless of what you think yeah. of it. And if yeah. you think it's yeah. expensive, yeah. the Mac Pro, the MacBook Pro, it's a great laptop. I mean, the hardware wise, it's a great laptop. There's nothing you could say about it that they, you know, it's cheap or this is not good. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, there's a couple but, things yeah. that I don't like about it, but regardless, yeah. it, it's it's a solid piece of hardware. Absolutely. I don't think anybody would have been able to have the success that 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 Apple has had with the iPad if they came up with it. I think that. The, well, the, it, it, it's not even worth debating. No one else would have come up with nobody, it. You, nobody. You yeah. saw you talked about Sony, right? Have you ever actually seen Sony's MP3 players? Have you ever seen yeah, the yeah, yeah. 11,000 pieces of plastic and metal that make up these devices and the insane UIs and the weird stuff you have to do to get songs onto them. And I mean, this, this, the, those people can't design anything to save their well, lives. It was They're, so bad that creative was leading the MP3 market at one point and Sony right. couldn't even compete with them. It so. was a beautiful market for Apple to enter because I'm sure they looked at what was, what was there at the time. And that stuff was horrible. Remember there was a, a creative MP3 player that was literally shaped like a DVD player yeah. Right. So you would be comfortable using it, apparently. But they needed something for the huge battery. What was the other one? Had. The Riviera? Rivera? God, <laughs> no, I forgot was, the other one. There was uh, another one that everybody well, had. Well, no, it was, it was a Rio. There Rio. were a Rio devices, yeah. right? And um, Creative Zen. That's Creative what it Zen, was. Yeah, yeah. People don't remember, but they had a, they had a podcasting category. <laughs> the sure. Creative Zen podcasting category that nobody used. The Rio was the other one. Um, all right. So let's go into our game this week. Okay. We have uh, the two that that uh, we're gonna pick: uh, Facebook yep. and mobile internet. I guess they mean like 4G in 10 years. Um, mm. I'm gonna flip a coin. We have coin. to pick one, or are we? Um... We could do both. We could do both. Which okay. one do you want to pick first? Oh, I see. Because we, I, I, I'm picking for you though, aren't oh, I? Oh, okay. Yeah, you pick yeah. for me. I think you should do mobile internet. Ah, okay. So in 10 years. Uh, I still think we're going to be on 4G. <laughs> wow. And, and I'm serious about that. I think yeah, we're going to no, be on 4G. I, yeah. I think the longevity, you have to remember the longevity of 3G. People don't remember 3G before smartphones. But 3D, 3G existed in 2002. Uh, it existed in, yeah, 2002. Because I had a cell phone that was a 3G cell phone in 2002. Mm. No, wait a minute. 2003. So almost, I mean, it's been nine years. 3G is still implemented in, in a lot of phones. People, Most people are still on 3G. So I think we're going to have 4G, but 4G is going to be, the longevity of 4G is going to be even longer than 3G. Um, 
I and this is the sad thing. Now, will mobile internet come into the home? This goes back into what we discussed last week. And right after the show, Verizon put out a, I think, press release that they're going to charge you a hundred dollars a month for ten gigs, of uh, 4G internet at the house. A hundred. A hundred bucks for ten gigs. Now that's not bad. What's the speed though. A uh, 4G. No, well, I don't right. know. What I guess whatever you're able to get in your area. So okay. it varies. I, I guess it varies anywhere from you know seven megabits a second to if you're in my area and you get Verizon 4G, I'm getting 28 megabits a second. That's great. I mean actually. that's phenomenal. So for a hundred bucks, you don't have to have it's wires still, leading up. Expen- it is expensive. <laughs> it is expensive. You're only yeah. getting 10 gigs, but where would that be in 10 years? I don't think it's going to be much better. Mm. I think we're still going to have this crazy pricing cap. We're going to have the, uh, the, the we're going to have the crazy pricing and the data cap in ten years. It might be even worse, considering you know if you if you go based on the ratio of what we're getting at the time. Um, but I could see, and this goes into this plays with the net neutrality. I could see companies saying, okay, well, you know what? If you get the Verizon package with YouTube support. Uh, because remember, when we're talking about net neutrality, a lot of it went for the home and, and the mobile space is still up in the air. Right. I think they're going to start saying, well, if you get Verizon or if you get, let's say, the Verizon LG uh, Hulu phone, Hulu, is it doesn't count towards your data cap. Or if you get the net- Netflix phone, it doesn't count. If you get the YouTube phone, it doesn't count. So I think that's what's going to come into play with mobile Internet, especially for the phone and tablets. Depending on what package you have and depending on what phone you have, certain things are not going to be uh, counting towards your data cap. Which kind of, you know, if you look at Fios TV, the television works off of the, the internet line, the IP line. Yep. So uh, I think that's where we're going to go. Where do you think, Paul? Do you agree with anything I said or do you think I'm just crazy? Yeah, no, I agree with most of it. I mean, uh, Verizon just, uh, they, they didn't announce it, but they, they sort of announced that they will be announcing family plans for 4G. Right. I think that would play into this, too. Um, yeah. And, and we, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, this notion that Verizon will combine all the stuff into one bill. I mean, imagine if you could. Com- if, what if you could combine bandwidth from different accounts and and split them up differently every month? You know, in other words, mm-hmm. I have a, some kind of 4G plan on my phone. My wife does. One of my kids does. We have the house account. What if that was just a pool of bandwidth and we could allot that as needed? You know, yeah. Um, and and perhaps pay less per month uh, as a group, you know. Um, yeah, I could see that. I don't know. How, I, I guess the only issue is that AT and T obviously has some uh, home service. I, I believe it's separate from the wireless stuff, and Verizon does. And it's right now it's technically separate, although I you know it has that billing thing. Um, you know, for other carriers, it's kind of unclear how. They would combine that stuff. I, I, I guess it would require deals with, uh, you know, between the wireless carriers and the, and the providers. I really also sure. think there's going to be uh, three services. Three. Um, um, I think there's going to be there's going to be a Verizon. There's going to be um, there's going to be AT and T. And I think, and this is just a crazy guess. I think there's going to be a third company that it's almost like a union amongst the little ones. Where they all share that whatever space they have right. to create competition. So like a T-Mobile or, or let's say a company. I think Sprint's out. They're going to be done in 10 years. Right, right. So that, that's where I'm going with that. Uh, Facebook is the next one, Paul. Yeah, this is similar to the, uh, <laughs> the Google stuff in a way. It's, or I guess it was Android we were talking about a couple of weeks ago where they're either going to be going gangbusters or we'll just be gone. You know, I... I heard an, uh, it was an ex AOL executive who referred to Facebook recently as the new walled garden, you know, i.e., yeah, the yeah. New, new version of AOL. And there's no doubt about it. I mean, it is, it is that thing, you know, it, it but it, I, you know, I think there's something to be said for a place where you go and you know people and it's not the whole internet, you know, it's, it's some, kind of sharing social thing. And I, I do think there's a, a great chance that Facebook will simply be around and will be doing great. I think that in the next 10 years, we're going to see Facebook do such things as get into hardware. As many people have uh, rumored that, you know, maybe Facebook is looking at doing a phone. I think that makes lots of sense. Um, 
and will continue to yeah. be the the dominant social networking service. I, I I I think the thing that Facebook has latched on to that's very important is the ability for people to form a virtual community essentially just you know do things that are together. I I understand that Facebook is horrible in many ways for the privacy type stuff and I know that that's a problem. But on the other hand, when I look at Facebook, I see things like my cousins, who I would never talk to other than at family yeah. rooms, whatever, are going on trips with their kids and are doing stuff or whatever it is. And um, I, I, that's wonderful. I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful. And so I, I think that Facebook is going to be around, and I think they're going to be important and be a big deal. They will be as possibly as big as Google is. I well, mean, they, they could, the they service they're up- offering, the, the direct service, in many ways is far more important than what Google is doing. I mean, they could end up like AOL. you got to also remember, AOL was... Yeah, well, they could end up like MySpace, right? They could yeah. all, they could disappear. You know, MySpace was kind of the same thing. I think there's too much money invested in that company for them to make those mistakes, right? You know, and and too much too much third party, I guess. Uh, I, I guess the only possible issue would be if there's any blowback, you know, where at some point Facebook becomes r- really uncool, you know, and that that's not where people are. But I th- I just think they have such a huge audience, and that this thing will just kind of continue. Um, there's a lot of things that we do on the side right now that really could be done only through Facebook. You know, for example, people check in uh, at restaurants or locations using other services. I mean, come on. I <laughs> like think that's to me, that's Facebook. I think know? Facebook's dominance is going to come into play over the next 10 years with uh, other countries except for, you know, U.S. and the U.K., I think sure. there are many developing countries out there right now that, you know, they're a couple of years behind us as far as Internet and technology goes. But once they reach to the level that we are, can you imagine what that's going to be like? I mean, when Facebook, let's say Facebook, you know, fully gets into China. Right. Uh, right. And, you know, this is a country well, that's already has pretty- Facebook is already, you know, Facebook was a factor in uh, the Arab Spring uprisings that occurred in, in Cairo yeah. and uh, in Tripoli. Um it will factor into similar things that will occur in China, no doubt about it. Um, I I just think it's it, it is to sort of I, it it is what's right about the internet in many ways, which is weird to say because in some ways it's also what's wrong about the internet, of yeah, course, yeah. Uh, from a privacy stuff. But I think they'll get that stuff right. I mean, I think they'll have to. You know, I think they'll they'll be goaded into doing the right thing eventually. But you know, like I said, I think. Uh, you can make a, a justification that what they offer people, like regular people, is more important than, say, even what Google does. Oh, so you know, that, that's going to be how we communicate. They become the government database. I mean, that's what that. <laughs> yes, or a government unto themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean that. That's or government. Yeah, they could have sure. their own country. Sure. Uh, thank you, Paul. That was good. I agree with everything you said. Actually. Wow. Everything. <laughs> Even down to the government database. <laughs> the government database. Uh, I want to remind everybody, if you miss any portion of the show, you can go to our website, gfknetwork.com, and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, we're on iTunes. We're on Zoom. We're pretty much everywhere you can imagine. Uh, check out Paul every Thursday on the Twit Network for his show, Windows Weekly. We cover all things Microsoft. Uh, or go to Paul's website, winsuperside.com. You can follow me on Twitter, at Andrew Zarian. You can follow Paul at The Rot. And uh, that about wraps it up for today, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Here. Sorry for the technical difficulties. No problem at all. Um, sure that was... And you know what? We'll continue the Facebook discussion next week because <laughs> people, people uh, want to hear about that, and that's a very lo- large topic for us to talk about. And we'll see you all next week on What the Tech Tonight, everybody.